<laughs> Rotate your phone. Ice cream. Ice cream. Good morning. How are you today? The sun is shining, but we've got mess. But it's supposed to it's supposed to be relieved from us a little bit later. Is it supposed to get warmer? And then tomorrow it's supposed to be. 50 again, up and down, up and down. But isn't that how life goes? <laughs> up and down, up and down. Well, I'm glad that you're here. And uh, I know that several of you have had communion before you came here. And I hope you had a wonderful time there as well. So uh, what we're looking at today is we're looking into Galatians chapter 3. And we got through to about verse 15. So we're going to be picking up there. But I'd like us to start out with a word of prayer, if we could. And before we begin, I know that uh, we want to have people be heard. So uh, Peggy is filling in for our angel joy. Um, and so she has the microphone. Okay, raise your hands and Peggy will bring the microphone to you. Right. Yes. She got her hair cut so she could be lighter and move faster today. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious, loving God, we thank you for this day, for yet another day of sunshine. And wherever you, we are with you, the sun does shine. Not the S-U-N, but the S-O-N. Shines in our lives, shines in our hearts. And so, Lord, we just ask as we're gathered together that you might inspire us that your Holy Spirit might anoint us, that we might be given the right thoughts and the right questions to ask, that you might lead us into your truth so that we might follow you, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you for our fellowship and time together. We'll give you praise for everything that comes our way because you are in everything. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to back us up just a little bit. Remember that in uh, Galatians chapter 1, we were considering what, what voice of authority do we listen to. And we also understood that what happens is that we actually give authority to others to speak to us, to inform us. Some people will claim authority, but it's our responsibility to weigh uh, their authority and to give those particular voices, authorities over us. Sometimes someone can be uh, claim authority and uh, they can misinform us and misdirect us. And so Paul addresses that as he uh, tries to explain to the Galatians uh, his basis of his authority. And his authority was not based upon his credentials from some organization, um, but his authority was based upon revelation upon his revelation that he received in his um, of Jesus Christ to him and so he quoted his background his experience his his actual resistance and persecution of the church and then the radical transformation that happened in his life as a basis of his authority he then also said that in order not to uh, have greater credentialing, he did go back and he spoke to James and Peter and whatever to explain his message to the Gentiles. And they also then confirmed uh, his message and sent him back out. He didn't do it because he felt he needed to uh, in order to feel that he had the authority, 
but he wanted to be able to um, have that credentialing to, to uh, draw others to listen to his message because some would always question what authority. When I thought about that, I remember a time in which Jesus, can you remember, was challenged by the religious authorities. And they said, by what authority are you saying these things and doing these things? And he gave a response too. Um, so we have to question what authority and on what basis do we give authority to others to inform us. So we talked about that. Then in chapter 2, we find that Paul then had the audacity, I'm going to use that word, to challenge Peter. Because uh, even though Peter, we know, is an apostle who was there, uh, walked with Jesus and witnessed his, his uh, resurrection, but he actually challenged Peter because when Peter was in Antioch, which is the, uh, the capital of the uh, Gentile or non-Jewish church, uh, all of a sudden uh, Peter was eating with the Gentiles. And then all of a sudden when some folks came from Jerusalem, um, he got up from the table and he moved over and sat with them. Now, I don't believe that Peter realized what message he was giving, but basically what he was doing by leaving one group to go to another, he was giving by implication. Um, so Paul felt uh, that their message of requiring non-Jews to conform to Judaism before they could accept the Jewish Messiah. And uh, so he challenged Peter boldly, as we find in Galatians 2. Um, I don't think that Peter realized what he's doing. It's kind of like a church. After you have fellowship time, if you've been to a church that has fellowship time afterwards, people that know each other, feel comfortable with each other, tend to gravitate towards one another, right? Uh, but in this instance, because of the struggle or conflict between these two different groups, of what was it required to be considered a person of faith, by his getting up and his position as, you know, an apostle and moving over towards these other Judaizers who were requiring circumcision, following of the law in order to be a Christian, um, he was actually validating their argument or their position. There's a lot of times that we do things that we don't think about but and we need to be sensitive to. We speak not only through our words, but we also speak through our actions. You know, And so I don't think that Peter realized what his actions were implying. And so Peter corrected him. We also find, though, that while that can be shocking, that in the, the uh, end of First Peter, uh, that Peter actually talks about Paul. And he speaks of him... Uh, in great terms. So it tells us that sometimes we can have disagreements as Christian people. But, you know, the love of Christ and the grace is that which heals those rifts that we might have and we come to a mutual understanding. That's the way it should be. Unfortunately, oftentimes it doesn't work that way, does it? So our actions speak as loud as our words and sometimes speaks louder than our words. So that's kind of what was in chapter 2. Then we came to chapter 3, and in chapter 3, basically Paul gives his argument of why he believes this way and uh, regarding the change between following the law to then following Christ. Now, I do want to stop there and just ask, uh, just, just recapping where we've been, uh, in case someone wasn't here, is there any questions that you have uh, from what I just shared that we could lift up and try to answer together? Did I clarify and speak it accurately? Okay. Very good. Then I want to pick us up just a little bit. We we're actually left off at verse 14, picking up at verse 15. I'm going to start us off at 6, only to ask two questions. Okay, consider Abraham. 
He believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And that's a direct quote from Scripture. You'll find that in Genesis 15, verse 6, where all of a sudden God was promising him. Go ahead. What chapter? Uh, in Genesis, it's chapter 15, verse 6. No. But we're in Galatians. What chapter 3? Yes. 3. Okay. So that's a direct quote. He, uh, God was promising in chapter 15 of, of Genesis that uh, he was going to do something wonderful with Abraham and he was going to be a blessing to the whole world, to all the nations. And then there's something unusual that happens in Genesis 15 that's important to understand. And that is, is that they did something. He ha had him do a sacrifice and the sacrifice was cut in half and then there, Abraham saw a flaming torch that went through the pieces of the offering. The significance of that, then it, after that, it says, Today I make a covenant with you, Abraham. There are certain covenants uh, in the Bible that are important to understand. The first is that there's a covenant with, a, with Adam, uh, uh, the Adamic covenant. There is, we oftentimes know of the covenant with Noah, you know, flooded the earth. And then he had made a covenant and says, by this rainbow, it's a sign that I will not destroy the earth again by flood. Okay. Uh, but there are other covenants. We call actually the Old Testament and the New Testament are actually the original words are covenants. The old covenant, the new covenant. And so God made a covenant with Abram, okay? That's an agreement, a contract, okay? So I make a contract, an agreement with you, Abram, that if you do this, I'm going to, I promise you that you're going to, I'm going to give you this land, I'm going to lead you from being a wandering person and your, uh, those who follow after you, you know, the Hebrews, into this land, this promised land, Okay? and I'll make you the father of many nations. Okay? So he's making an agreement. Um, so there's a promise to a covenant, and there's also obligations to a covenant. So God makes a covenant with us, uh, and then we have certain obligations in that contract. So if I were to make a contract, okay, uh, with Carol, okay, I'm going to do this, Carol, and if I do this, this is what I expect of you. And we agree on that, those conditions of the contract, and that becomes an agreement between us. Right. Okay? And so he made a covenant with Abraham. So what happened is that in that passage it says, and uh, Abram believed God. He didn't have that land. He wasn't a blessing to all the nations yet, but he believed God trusted God. So believing is trusting. It's not just what you have here. Believing is actually trusting. He trusted God's promise. Okay? And because he trusted it, it was credited to him as righteousness. Now there was another covenant that was made. And that covenant was with Moses. And that was given by the law. Okay? So the law came through Moses. So there's several different covenants, and that's important for us to understand uh, Paul's argument. So he goes on. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. Ooh. Now what type of thought or feeling does that sentence give to you? God, scripture foresaw, we're in verse 8, that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. What type of thought does that give you? Let me put it another way. Does that give you any greater appreciation for God? Sounds like favoritism. Favoritism? Yeah. Well, what it speaks to me is that I'm living in this time in 2024. 
God is active today. God was active back in the time of Abraham and also the time of Moses. But God has a plan. But God's plan is not just given at, you know, 1400 B.C. God had a plan, and he's working out that plan through time. And so God foresaw the blessing of the whole world, which we know came through Jesus Christ. And he announced that gospel. The gospel is the story of God's redemption of humankind through the giving of his son, Jesus Christ. He announced it before Christ was ever born. God has been working out his wonderful plan. And that gives me hope. I don't know about you, because I really don't understand what God is doing today in some things in our world. But I trust God. I trust God because of what I've seen and experienced, what God has done. And so I can trust God for what I don't know that God is doing now, but he's promised. How do I know about heaven and what the joys of heaven? It's promised to me. I haven't been there. Have you been there? I haven't been there. You have to trust. You trust Jesus Christ. And so he says in John 14, Jesus said to his disciples in preparing for his, his death, he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. I tell you that I go to my father's house. There are many rooms. And I have gone ahead to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me always. That's a wonderful promise. How do we know it's true? By faith. By faith. So many things that came true. So I go ahead, please. Uh, I always struggle with the difference between faith and what I see mm -hmm. and what surrounds me. Mm -hmm. In other words, I I always search for God's hand in what's going on. Mm -hmm. and sometimes I can't see it. It's hard to see it. Yeah. Yes. So therefore, I have to rely on faith. Yes. And I sometimes, where does faith end and the visible God begin? Mm -hmm. And to me, that's the struggle. It is a struggle. You know, it's supposed to be a struggle. Do you know the name for Israel, what it really means? Those who struggle with God. Isn't that interesting? So we are the new Israel. We struggle with God. I don't have all the answers. And I wish I did. But I trust God and what God provides. Yes, Darren. Can I read like three verses to this man? Here. Go ahead. Two Corinthians. I read this. I read this about five times last night. Yes. Use the microphone if you could. Or, or call me D. This one um, comes out of two Corinthians, starting at um, chapter four, sixteen, seeing the invisible. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll start at. Um, I'll just read it all. It's only like three verses. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward... No, I'll, I'll go to the part where he's going to talk about While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, or the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are external. Mm -hmm. Eternal. Eternal. There's another passage that's very famous that I know you know it. It's from the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and it says now faith is being sure of what we hope for and being certain of what we do not yet see that's hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 it's the definition of faith so um we have faith in what we the promises of god and so what it said here, the reason why I'm taking some time on it, it's so important for us to understand. The scripture foresaw what God would justify the Gentiles by faith. He announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. And it started out that sentence by saying, Abraham believed God and it was credited 
to him as righteousness. He did, he, and in Hebrews 11, it goes on talk, talking about he, uh, that Abram didn't see the promise fulfilled. But he acted on the promise and followed God in faith. He trusted God. So faith is that trust, even when we don't see uh, the fulfillment of it. Uh, matter of fact, the end of that chapter, chapter 11, um, the author of Hebrews, which we be, believe is Apollos, I think is the most uh, uh, reasonable explanation, um, uh, said that all these people followed God by faith, and none of them saw it fulfilled. And, and there was on to say, but we have. We are so fortunate because we've seen the promises of God fulfilled in Jesus Christ. We're so, so, it's, it's so important that we understand that. Now, go to verse 10. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written under the book of the law. We did mention this last time. What is the curse? Sin. Hmm? Is it sin? It's sin is the curse, yes. And we all are under that curse. We all sin. But what, what, does, uh, what is the curse for us? We have to do everything under the law. You know, it's not, I can say that I'm a good boy. I could be like the rich young ruler we mentioned last week who came to Jesus and Jesus looked at him and loved him. And he said to him, you know, since I was a child, I have done everything, everything that the law required as far as he knew. But then he said, but there's one thing that you need to do and take all that you have and give it away to the poor and follow me. He didn't realize how much his wealth and his possessions claimed him. It wasn't that we're all supposed to give it all away, but what it means is that there's every one of us has something that holds us and that we're not totally free as long as it holds us. And we can do good uh, we can break the law in one place and we break it everywhere. So we're all under sin and we all need grace. Okay? So clearly, he says, no one is justified be- before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. That's another quote from Scripture coming from Genesis. The just, okay, all those are righteous will live by faith. So he goes, he's he's developing his argument. It's a complicated argument, okay? But Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Now, the question, the last one on this section I'm going to ask you is how has Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law? Of having to do everything and do it all right. How has he redeemed us? He died for us. How did that redeem us? Well, before Christ, um, people lived or tried to live by the law. Mm-hmm. And I have in my book that the law was a, was good for the Jews as a way to become clean while living in an unclean world. Mm-hmm. So that was their guidance. Mm-hmm. They, their, their thinking was they, were, they would stay clean and everybody else wasn't. Okay. And then comes Christ who says... The law is there are things in the law that are good for you, but you must live by believing in me. Okay. If your faith and that's enough. Okay. What else do we know about um, about Jesus? Did he sin? No. He was without sin. So only those who are cursed, and the curse is sin, deserve to die. And the law actually was the instrument that put Christ to death on the cross. Okay. They claim that he blasphemed God. 
he broke the law. But he didn't because he was God. See? So he wasn't lying. So, but he died, though he didn't deserve that death. So he took on the curse of death for us, yet he was without sin. But you and I can never say that. There's always going to be some place, no matter how good we try to be, there's going to be some sin that we, that we have. So he took the curse for us. So that if we believe in him, then our sins are forgiven. Now, if we believe in them, that means we have faith in him. Which means, how do we know that our sins are forgiven? We don't. That's right. The only way we know is by faith. Okay? Is by faith. Trusting in the promise that Jesus gave. Okay? And, you know, in John 3.16, which uh, one of my uh, members uh, preached on yesterday, um, is that, For God so loved the world, not just the Jews, not just Christians, but God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes on him or have faith in him shall not die but have everlasting life. God did not send his son to condemn the world, but that through him they might be saved, saved from condemnation. Okay? So that's our belief, our faith. We're saved by faith. You know, I don't know what heaven's going to be like. I believe it's true. I'm betting my whole life on it. Literally. Literally. Okay. Um... I'm bidding my whole life because I'm giving myself to defining my life by, by faith in Christ. But how do I know? Have you ever had someone ask a question, what would I be giving up by following Christ? And, you know, what if I'm wrong? What if I spend my life following Christ and I find in the end that I'm wrong and then you find out that you were, would have been right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the problem. That's right. Yeah. It's totally yeah. by faith. Yeah. Okay? And that's important to realize. And that's the argument that Paul is trying to give these Judaizers who are saying, yeah, you can have our Jewish Messiah. He is our Messiah. But in order to have him as our Messiah, you also need to follow the law. Okay? Let's not have a conversation unless we can enjoy the whole group, okay? Darren? Yeah. Darren? Let's have, we want to have the conversation within the whole group, okay? All right, thank you. Um, so that's an important thing. So now I want to have us start with verse 15. Is there someone who would like to read verse 15 through 18? Would you? Very good, thank you. Oh, watch out. She's bringing the microphone to you. <laughs> watch out. Here goes back. Thank you. Brethren, allow me to give you an everyday example. Once a human will has been ratified, no one can make further additions to it or set it aside. Now the promises were made to Abraham and his descendants. It does not say, and to your descendants, as referring to many, but it says, and to your descendant. That is, to one person, who is Christ. This is what I am saying. The law which came 430 years later cannot invalidate a covenant that has been previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. Obviously, if the inheritance comes from the law, it no longer comes from the promise. However, God bestowed it on Abraham through a promise. Okay. Now, that's a lot of words. How about summarizing it for you? What, what is his argument? He's giving some more support for his argument that's only by faith. What is he saying here? That Christ will come through from Abraham and following in the line. Okay. All right. What else? That's very true. 
It's the promise that counts, not the law. The promise that counts the is not the law. The promise frees us from the law. That's right. That's right. And, and if the promise is much stronger than the law, yes. it comes directly from God, from Jesus. Yes. Jesus will show us the way, mm -hmm. but it's the promise, and nothing we really can do to earn that, mm -hmm. it's given to us. Mm -hmm. And that's strengthened by our faith, I think. Yes. But no. It's tough to believe. It's tough to believe. Now, what he's also saying, as far as history is concerned, when God makes a promise, God doesn't break a promise. God does not break a promise. Well, God gave the law to Moses, but 430 years before, God made a covenant or a promise with Abram. So whatever comes after that promise to Abraham cannot be broken. So in other words... The Judaizers are those people who were depending upon following the checklist of the law. Um, you know, they were invalidating the promise that was given earlier in a covenant to Abraham. Right? So he says, Abraham believed God and has credited him as righteousness. So all we need to do is believe God and believe the promise. And that's our righteousness. I'm going to screw up. I do all the time. I ask my wife and she tells me. <laughs> Sometimes she tells me in church. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. But didn't the Jews have to follow the law? Weren't they instructed to follow the law? Yes. Because Jesus has not come yet. Yes. So they're bound by the law. Yes. So we can't condemn them for following the law. Yes. But yet Jesus, when Jesus came... He said to them, I am the promise. Yes. Because, again, when he locked horns uh -huh. with, with the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they were telling him, you're wrong because you're not following the law. You're doing things that are contrary to the law. Mm -hmm. But I feel sorry for them mm -hmm. because they're really in a bind. They've been told for a thousand years, you must follow the law. Yes. And then suddenly, yep. along Jesus, yep. and he's telling him almost the direct opposite. Right. Now, Jesus said, I am the fulfillment of the yeah, law. Right, yeah. You know? So that, that, that's... Go ahead. What? They can't hear. Oh, they couldn't hear. Sorry. I'm so. sorry. <laughs> I don't know if I can repeat it. Oh, yeah, you, you did a very good job. Good. It's always hard when you have to repeat it. I heard it. <laughs> I was defending the Jews because they were, for as long as they practiced their religion, they were told, you must follow the law. Mm -hmm. And when Jesus came, he was in conflict with that. At least they saw it that way. And here comes this guy. He's, you know, he's Jesus. We know mm -hmm. who he is. Yeah. He's a carpenter. And now the carpenter is telling the high priest, that they're wrong. <laughs> that's, that's, that's hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think that was almost, I, I hate to use the word, unfair. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to apply that to Jesus, because he can't be unfair. Well, you know, that's, what's important is that everyone who looks to Christ, whether you're a Jew, whether you're a Gentile, whether, whatever you are, man or woman, you are one in Christ. As a matter of fact, that's part of this passage we're going to come to. So while it seems unfair, it is also fair. And we'll go on and explain that uh, in, in just a little bit here. What someone then, you know, he did, uh, well, I'll, if you read Romans chapter 13 or 14, I can't remember which one it is, it's one of those two. Paul says, uh, actually, if you'll let me turn to that, maybe I can, uh, bum, bum, bum. he talks about, uh, oh, it's, it's, I'm sorry, it's chapter 11. And then uh, verse 25. So this is Romans chapter 11, verse 25. Um, and this may bring out a little bit more of the fairness, okay? Uh, answer that question. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. 
Okay? As it is written in the Old Testament, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob, and this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and his call are irreversible. So just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. So I, that's, Paul answers that question in that Israel itself, we live up to what we know, what God has revealed. They were living up to the law and they were missing the gospel. But that doesn't mean that God is going to condemn them they will, you know, they're looking for the Messiah to come yet. We have found the Messiah has already come. When the Messiah comes the second time, in the second coming, Israel will recognize him as the Messiah. You see? And so God holds us accountable to what we know. And, the more, and we're supposed to know more. We're supposed to always study and, and learn and grow. But there's a danger to that. Because the more you know, the more is expected of you, right? And, and so, the more you realize that you don't know yet. <laughs> yes. See, those who think they got it all, in their arrogance, they actually sin. You know? It's by faith we are saved. I trust God even when I don't know. I don't know. Uh, and that's where faith comes in. We trust the promise of God. Go ahead. You wanted to say something again. That's all right. Aren't you better off being ignorant? <laughs> well, like the Gentiles. you may say that. Uh, some people would say, would actually, yeah, I, I want to limit my liability. That's, you know, the problem is God has an expectation of, and that's of us, and it's in his word. And uh, the author of Hebrews, again, goes in chapter 5 and 6 and uh, uh, reminds them that there's no excuse for ignorance. Though now you should be mature, I still have to feed you on baby food. You need to go on. And so God expects us to grow, you know. And a refusal to grow is actually a sin. A sin is not living up to God's expectation of us. Didn't I just answer my own question? <laughs> the fact that I say and I realize that ignorance is bliss, mm -hmm. I must realize that that's not true. That's, tr that's not true. Because in that statement, you're recognizing a higher power. Yes. You're recognizing Jesus. Yes. And you're denying him. Or yes. you're trying to. Yes. But you're not getting away with it. That's very good when we're talking about Peter and the denial of Christ. Mm -hmm. There are many Christians who deny Christ because they don't want to fulfill his will for their lives, which means to grow in grace and faith and knowledge. Mm -hmm. See? So that is a sin. Okay? That we need to repent of. And we can be forgiven for. Right? Mm -hmm. So the more you know, the no, someone else said that, I think, uh, the more you realize you don't know. Mm -hmm. well, when I was a new Christian, I was like, Okay, now I'll, I'll learn everything and started studying and went, oh, but wait a minute. I don't know that. But when I get to that, you know, which is wonderful. I'm, how many of you are over 75? <laughs> how many of you are over 80? Okay. Do you know that God's not finished with you yet? God still expects you to grow. And, and that's a wonderful thing. We don't outgrow God or God's purposes for us. That's a wonderful thing. How many people do you know that have senile depression? Mm -hmm. Meaning, you know, my life is over. I'm just living out my last days. No, that's a terrible way to live. It's a terrible way to die. No, we have a purpose no matter you know, what age we are. 
You know, I have great, I have grandchildren. Maybe I'll live to have great grandchildren. But you know, I had them in church yesterday because they usually go to their church, but they visit in our church. And I didn't have to preach, so I could spend some time with them. But you know, it was a wonderful thing to realize that they are my inheritance. It's not what wealth I have, what things I enjoy. Only thing I'm going to leave behind me is my children, my grandchildren, and my great-grandchildren. And if I can influence them so they can have abundance of life, that is a high purpose in my life. And we never outgrow the purposes God has for us. I want us to continue. Then he goes on to explain even further, which is very good. On verse 19. Someone want to read from verse 19? I will. Okay. Wait for the mic here so everyone can hear. Yeah, verse 19. I know, but we need, we're broadcasting too. I was told to shh, shh, shh. I was explaining her the Bible a little bit. Oh, okay. I'm not talking about the Laker game or anything. Uh, uh, that's all right. I wouldn't yeah. sit here and conversate yeah. on her own. Okay. I know, but we want to have a conversation oh, together. Yeah. Okay. We always do that afterwards. Okay. She never picked up the Bible. Yeah. So you got to read this. And yes. So if you would, read word verse 19. Yeah. Okay. Um, you will say then, broken, you will say branches will... Sorry. You're in verse 19? You will say then branches mm -hmm. were broken, off that I might be granted in. No, you're reading the wrong book. You're oh. back in Romans. It's Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. Right. It's my fault because I pop you back and forth. Yes, there are. 66 of them. right? <laughs> yep. What purpose then does yeah. the law serve? It was added because of transgressions, so the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was appointed through the angels by the hand of the mediator. Now, a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Okay, now that... Is the law that against the right. promise of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, Truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scriptures had confirmed all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith, but after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Very good. I'm going to have you stop right there. It was very good. So what's the purpose of the law? And it's kind of part of what your question was. Okay. Well, the, the purpose of the law, what he's saying there is the purpose of the law is to show us how much we screwed up. Okay. Uh, it shows us our errors. Because, you know, we can't change unless we know what's wrong. Right? Well, if we have faith, it says here the way to escape is open to all who believe in him. Yes. So what happens is that the law was given so that we could see our need for grace. Okay? And once we see our need for grace, then we can turn by faith to receive that grace. Grace is available to everyone. But who takes hold of grace? Only those who recognize they need grace, right? And so that's the purpose of the law. Now it goes on to verse 21, says, uh, Then is the law opposed to the promises of God? No. Now, wait a second. If the law can't save me, then how, you know, uh, then if I live up to the law, I should be okay, right? But I don't live up with the law all the way. Okay? So, we're all under the prisoners of sin. 
so that we might be led, so he says in verse 22, so that what was promised being given through faith in Christ Jesus might be given to those who believe. Okay? So the law is still right, but it can't lead us to life. I had someone present salvation one time as if you are dying of thirst mm -hmm. and somebody brings you a bottle of water, but you don't drink it, you're not going to quench your thirst. So it's the same thing. God has provided us with salvation, but we have to accept that. That's yes. correct. So... That's correct. That's not a choice. Now, before this faith came, we were held prisoners to the law. And you did a, you did a nice word. Your version had tutor. The law was put in charge to lead us to Christ. Oh, the law was given to lead us to Christ. How it leads us to Christ is it shows us our need for grace. Tutor being, being in charge. Being in charge. Now... I have, I said, I have two of my grandchildren with their mom and dad that live in our home, which I am, it's wonderful to have, okay? But I do know that in with my own children when I raised them, and when my daughter and my son-in-law are raising their little girls, I have to remove myself because they're not mine, or, you know, I'm grandpa. But um, it's kind of hard for me. Not to step into a parent role. How many of you grandparents have found that out? Okay. And I have to sometimes go, I'll go into my office, I'm going down to my den so I can let you guys work this out. But one of the things that happens is that they lay down the law. Okay, this is what you need to do. This is, you don't do this, right? If, if you have loving parents, they make boundaries or laws, okay, that you have to follow. And of course, Lydia loves to get into the cupboard. She knows where the peanuts are. And so she takes off the top of the peanuts, takes a whole bunch of peanuts, and then leaves the top of the jar there next to the pe peanut jar, where I said, you know, if you're really smart, this is what grandpa's can do. If you're really smart, you put the lid back on. So we don't know. <laughs> but, but you know, there, there are certain rules why you know, mom doesn't want you to have those peanuts because we're going to have dinner soon. You know, there's certain rules. Okay? So it's not the rules were wrong. <laughs> but what happens is that there's, there's a time in which a child grows up. Right? As a tutor for them. Until they come to maturity and they grow up. And then when they grow up, they're responsible. So the law is helpful for us. The law is not wrong. But what's the difference? When they mature, the laws become a part of them. Okay? They're not imposed upon them. All of a sudden, I heard one of my grandchildren, I'm sorry for using them as an example because I watch them all the time. You know? But all of a sudden, um, one of the grandchildren hurt the grandson by something they said. <laughs> it made me tear up. When all of a sudden, the one granddaughter sought out my other grandson and apologized. I didn't make her. Mom and Dad didn't make her, but she was taught that, and it became a part of her. And so she fulfilled the law's demands on her own because it came a part of her. Go ahead. your point about us as adult parents, mm -hmm. uh, models, um, we can talk and talk and talk, but if we don't walk the walk, mm -hmm. it takes everything that we've said and throws it out. Um, we say to our children, don't lie, mm -hmm. never lie, it's always wrong, um, it, even if you think it's the best way, but don't lie, don't lie, don't lie, don't lie. And then we go to the movies where children 12 and under get in free, and we say to them, tell them you're 11. <laughs> yeah, <they're... laughs> I, I, had a, I had a wonderful dad, and he taught me something important about being a parent. 
And I had my dad take me aside uh, when I was a teenager and apologize to me. How many parents, while they're raising their children, will also admit, I'm sorry I was wrong? And, you know, that's an important thing to realize. They learn from not just what we say, they learn by what we do. Okay. Now, so the law became a tutor. It's useful for God because it brings us to the place where we can embrace Christ. Yes, Darren. Yeah, I was talking to my mother yesterday. Can you all hear me? No. 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 You have to use the mic. Okay. Okay. Yes, I was just talking to my mother last night the phone well after church and there was a time I was in the mall and I just kept walking and I didn't listen to her just ignored her it made me it hurt me inside a couple of days ago thinking about it so I I spoke to Jesus about it well she remembers it and she's she's like some of these people who just think oh you're a kid but it's not an excuse like I was an awful son, and and then I told her because we went to family therapy, and I, it was I couldn't even say I'm sorry to my dad until I was an older age, just to say that to my dad, I'm sorry, dad. It took a lot of courage, and I was nowhere near God until I was uh, 38. Well, like really towards the end. September 38th, I mean, 2018, but I didn't walk, I didn't walk with God for a long time, and now I know we have to forgive everybody, or the Father in Heaven won't forgive us, so it's a hard thing to uh, admit, and my, my dad, after that relationship, we could say we're sorry to each other, even for little things, sorry son, that's just something that, that makes you grow as a man. Especially if your parent, who's my dad's 34 years older than me, if he could say it to me, and I could say it to anybody. That's very powerful. It is powerful. We got to do it for Jesus Christ, though, because he forgave us. So if we mm -hmm. can't forgive people, then we won't be forgiven. Because that's why he went on the cross to forgive. Mm -hmm. Very God, true, Darren. God consoled us through him for our sins, because he was born with no sin, and it became sin for us. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. So what it is, is we, it, what it's talking about is the internalization of the law. And what Paul will say in the New Testament's about is that that internalization of the law happens through the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes upon one who believes and has faith, then it's no longer the law being imposed upon you. It's something that comes up from within you. And some people who claim to believe in Jesus, and I'm not accusing anyone, will also um, live externally. It's like, I have to do this. And so they're still a prisoner. Instead of it all of a sudden being internalized, because the Spirit uh, informs our spirit. And we want to do what is righteous. We want to please God. We want to do what is right. And that is what Paul was contending here. You can require these, these Gentiles to be circumcised, but that's not going to change their life. Their life was changed because they embraced Jesus Christ. And he transformed their life just as much as I was in Judaism. Remember back to chapter 1? I was following the law. And I was persecuting Christians until all of a sudden Christ broke through and transform my life. I don't live by the law anymore. The law is within me. And there's a passage in Jeremiah that I'll put the law in their hearts. That's where it's at. So we're going to close with verse 20, 6. It says, You are all Gentile and Jewish believers, sons of God, or sons and daughters of God, through faith in Christ Jesus. By faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ 
have clothed yourself with Christ. So in other words, by clothing ourselves with Christ, we have taken off the old clothes, the law. We've put on the, clo- the clothing of Christ, which means we live to please God in everything we do. And when I find that I'm not living to please God, and I've lived to please my own way, I recognize through the Holy Spirit that sin. And I need confession. And I need to repent of it. And then I am assured of my forgiveness. For all of you who are baptized in Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. One in Christ. You and I are both in the same boat. I don't care who you are, what your background is, you know, whether you're a male, female, whatever, we are all in the same boat and we need grace through faith in Christ. And so if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. See, the first seed was Jesus. Now a seed is planted and what does a seed do? It grows, right? So Christ was the seed promised to Abraham. And now because of our faith in Christ, the seed has grown. The seed of faith is within you and I. So we are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Isn't that beautiful? I find that beautiful. You know, he comes up with this argument in one chapter. I have to dissect it. You and I have to dissect it. I'm just amazed at his brain, you know, could come up with that. But it is also deep because we have to understand it, comprehend it. I hope it makes you more appreciative. So when I I see back of that verse, verse 8, the scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith He announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. Some people don't like the Old Testament, but you know the gospel was there. The gospel is not new. The gospel has always been there. We're just fortunate because we have seen the fulfillment because God sent his son. Go ahead. Is this the only book that is anonymous? They're not sure who authored it. Oh, they they knew that, that Paul authored Galatians, yes. It's Hebrews, they don't uh, know who authored that. Um, and Hebrews is a wonderful book because it explains the Old Testament, helps to understand what was done in the Old Testament, reflects and reveals Christ. And so um, they believe uh, there's a lot of different persons that could have been. You remember there's a person named Apollos, and he actually came along and worked with Aquila and Priscilla. We find him in the book of Acts. He was very educated and very literate. Um, and so many scholars believe that Apollos wrote the book of Hebrews, explaining how the Old Testament is fulfilled in the New. And he says in Hebrews that the, that, uh, the law is but a shadow of what was to come and fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Oh, God, I, I had it mixed up because Hebrews I have is all white. Yes. Not... Yes. Well, that takes us to our time. Oh, three minutes after, but we started three minutes later. I'm sorry. But um, any questions? Did I give you enough opportunity to answer and pose questions? That's important to me to do. Okay. I'll feel guilty and have to ask for forgiveness if I didn't, okay? <laughs> You're a wonderful group, and I hope this has helped you in understanding that. And next week, well, we're going to continue with that thing because he continues on. This, the chapter and verse demarcations are very, sometimes they don't fall in the right spot. And so, like, actually what he says here in verse 26 continues on into chapter 4. Yes, Darren. I can't hear you.
He says, uh, do, do you need to be anywhere yes, in the yes. next hour? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. yes they do. Very okay, I was just wondering because I said I was yeah. going to ask you, why don't we just do this for two Later hours? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't either. I've got an appointment with someone at the church. So, but thank you, Darren. Now we'll have we'll have further conversations. So write down your questions if you have. Read ahead and let's have some prayer. Gracious, loving God, we thank you for your word. We can never exhaust it. It's so deep, but yet so simple. Your love is so simple. All we need to do is to trust you, and follow you, and we're on the right way, and the right path. Thank you, Lord, for who you are and your love for us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Yep, thank you.